Good evening, Tributes, and welcome back to Tales of the Hunger Games. Before we begin, this week is slightly different, because it is not only I who has written these games, but Lauren McCouch, who has designed victory posters as well, has also written various sections of this week's games. Please check the link for her victory posters that will be in this video's description, along with the link for the art that is featured in this video, which is kindly provided by Andrew McLean. There are also plenty of other links in the description, so feel free to have a browse, but without further ado, let's go. This year's reaping in District 5 was widely considered one of the most eccentric of the year, something abnormal for District 5, who are usually the first to blend in. Ava Berwick, last year's victor, was clearly just going through the motions as she warily scrabbled around in the bowls for slips of paper. Withdrawing her hand from the male tribute bowl, she squinted to make out the tiny name printed on it. Marcellus Westinghouse, she read, and all eyes slowly panned over to a hulking young man of 18, scowling darkly at his misfortune. Years of operating heavy equipment in the power plants had built him like a carved rock, and more than one citizen recoiled as he silently trudged past and up to the stage. District 5 was usually quiet and tense, but this time one could hear a pin drop, while everyone in the crowd assessed if Marcellus had just woken up on the wrong side of the bed, or if he was really going to put the peacekeeper next to him in a half Nelson and tell him what he thought of the games. Luckily for everyone involved, he did no such thing, and there was an audible sigh of relief a moment later as everyone realised Marcellus was not going to stir up any trouble. Even Ava could be seen inching away from his general direction. Still, she busied herself with drawing the female tribute next. More squinting, Lynette Laurier. There was an uncomfortable pause, then BOOM! A vivid array of colourful sparks burst into the air, showering the entire square in a dazzling display. Families dived for cover. Ava and Marcellus ducked behind the podium. Peacekeepers wildly spun around, training their guns on the ground, until the plume of smoke parted to reveal a small, bemused 13-year-old girl, slightly singed and still holding what appeared to be the remnants of a homemade firework in her hands. Sorry. Accident, she admitted in the dead silence, scratching her head. The awkwardness stretched on as she casually clambered up the stairs to join Marcellus. Even he kept his distance from Lynette, as they were escorted into the Justice Building for their brief family visits, before being whisked off to the capital. Marcellus's only family member to visit was his younger brother, Junius, and the two shared some brief words before separating, without much emotion. Meanwhile, Lynette was visited by her mother, Louise, and her two younger sisters, Jacqueline and Rosalie. She exchanged tight hugs with all three of them, swiping furiously at a tear to avoid being seen crying by the cameras, and told Jacqueline to take care of their cat, Sir Pumpkin Wiggles. A moment later, she composed herself and rejoined Marcellus as they were escorted onto the train to the capital. They ate an enthusiastic lunch, with Marcellus brooding the entire time and Lynette playing pinfinger with a butter knife. Lynette inquired to a guard where their mentor was, to which he responded she would be there momentarily. Atala Jasper appeared a few minutes later, eating a bagel. She explained to the tributes that she had taken an interest in both of them after watching the reaping, and that she thought their best course of action would be to play to District 5's strengths this year and lay low, although she wasn't sure if Lynette could do that after the explosive impression she made on viewers at the reaping. Although clearly with her heart in the right place, Atala was still more interested in her bagel than her mentees so Lynette left the room a little later to take a nap until they arrived at the capital. As Marcellus and Lynette arrived in the capital, Ava arrived in District 2, and the Reaping Games took place shortly afterwards. This year, a record number of 13 gentlemen and 10 ladies of District 2 took part in these games, with most of them belonging to the Dalton elite. The games lasted for a record time of just over six hours, and when things became more stagnant halfway through the games, Bald eagles were sent into the arena, which caused several tributes to slip on the mud as they escaped from these birds, with some of them even opting to rip off their own bracelets, instead of having to face them. 17-year-old Dmitrius Surikov spent most of these games hiding by the edge of the arena and out of sight, which is indeed rather rare for a tribute in these reaping games. Although two other members of the Dalton elite decided to attack Demetrius together approximately halfway through the games, he defended himself with apparent ease and eliminated one of these tributes, whilst the other fled. When only Demetrius and another tribute, Gladius, were left, they were both called back to the centre of the arena. Despite being dwarfed by Gladius's sheer size, 
Demetrius put up a strong fight against Gladius, who now seemed rather exhausted, after having eliminated six of his fellow tributes. Demetrius then eliminated Gladius by kicking him with such force in the neck that his one remaining collar broke off, leaving Demetrius as the male tribute for District 2. After he made his victorious exit from the arena, two female tributes remained. 18-year-old Anamelia Prash had appeared to experience a literally breathtaking form of pleasure in eliminating her opponents, and she was now one of the final two ladies. As they were called back to the central area, Anamelia snuck up on her remaining opponent, Helveda, before pushing her into the ground and ripping off her bracelets. Even as Helveda tried to get back up, Anamelia groaned out with what some described as a sensual form of pleasure. Because of this, some parents allegedly even took their children away from the crowds that watched these games. That evening, Demetrius and Anamelia were announced to be this year's tributes for District 2. Many citizens seemed to find the difference in their personalities rather amusing, with Demetrius staying quiet and stoic, whilst Anamelia sported a rather seductive grin throughout the ceremony. The pair were then taken into the town hall. Surprisingly, it was later learned that Demetrius's family asked if he was sure that he wanted to take part in these games, and he had to convince them on several occasions that it was indeed what he wanted, whilst Anamelia was visited by some of her friends, who tried to remind her to remain focused although she allegedly stated that she just wanted to head straight to the capital. Shortly after the brief journey to the capital began, Demetrius and Anamelia allegedly had a rather explosive argument about an incident that had occurred during the Reaping Games, which resulted in Anamelia throwing a plate at Demetrius. Although Anamelia was known for her projectile precision, Demetrius was also known for his lightning reactions, which allowed him to duck and hence the plate hit an Avox who was standing behind Demetrius. Just as this commotion was occurring, the pair's mentors, Ennius Dalton and Maxima Liu, entered the carriage and Ennius quickly dismissed the Avox, who had fallen to the floor in pain. Maxima approached Anamelia, and after a look of shock, Maxima slapped Anamelia so hard that she too fell to the floor. Ennius and Maxima then decided to separate their mentees, so that they could talk to them in the little time that they had for this journey. It is unknown what was discussed between each pair, but once Demetrius and Anamelia were brought back together, Demetrius quickly forgave Anamelia, and their mentors told them about what to expect over the next week. When the parade took place the next day, Demetrius and Anamelia's stylist, Jurgen Cardew, explained that he wanted to make a definitive statement for a pair who had earned their roles in such unusual ways. He therefore dressed them in the outfits of peacekeepers, including the shiny white helmets that they traditionally wore, which he instructed the pair to remove halfway through the parade, in order to reveal their faces. It is rumoured that Anamelia was rather annoyed about this, as she had wanted to wear something that showed more of her skin, but after Demetrius calmly spoke to her, she was eventually convinced and wore this outfit. When Demetrius and Anamelia's carriage entered the avenue, they were immediately met with cheers and surprise shouts, especially due to their faces being covered, which essentially defeated the whole point of the parade. However, when they removed their helmets, they were met with applause from the crowd, although this reveal failed to make the same impact as what Jurgen had allegedly aspired. Lynette and Marcellus were dressed as wavy sun rays, festooned in streamers and soft shades of yellow to symbolise solar power, a developing technology in their district. Neither appreciated the large sun headdresses they were forced to wear though, which Lynette remarked to Marcellus reminded her of them being characters in a children's television show. Unfortunately this year, their costumes did not make Anderson Fashions best dressed, probably for this exact reason. Marcellus was beyond enraged at having to look like a circus pony in front of a large crowd, and so instead of raising their hands together, him and Lynette huddled and made a creative plan to spice things up. Using the small microphone she had been given to thank those throwing flowers at the tributes, Lynette waved her arms to get camera and audience attention. As their chariots started rumbling on, she grinned widely at the audience. Ladies and gentlemen, you've seen us as sons, but have you seen us moon? She swept her arm to the left to indicate Marcellus, who at that very moment turned around, bent over, and mooned the crowd. Immediately, it erupted in hysterics as people both cheered and jeered the pair for their outlandish antics. Lynette bowed while Marcellus smiled vindictively. The cameras hastened to cut away for the sake of censorship, but the damage had been done. Other tributes looked on in total shock at this bold action, the careers in disgust and the outer districts in awe. They had certainly made an impression, if not the typical one District 5 tributes were used to making. However, despite this little interruption, 
the ceremony proceeded as normally as possible. Later, over the coming days, the incident would become memorialised in several capital magazines, already as one of the top moments of this year's games, and much debate and analysis would be undertaken over the quality of March Ellis's rear on morning talk shows. However a controversial a parade, it was certainly a night to remember, yet it was District 7's tributes, Quirkus and Nutmeg, who were awarded with the role of best-dressed tributes in Anderson fashion, due to their fantastic arboreal designs which saw their faces covered in the thick bark of oak trees. Demetrius and Anamelia quickly met Zircon and Pearl, both from one, and the quartet practiced their skills together. According to Training Master Crane, the career tributes got on surprisingly well compared to their former counterparts. Anamelia and Zircon practiced hand-to-hand -hand combat, although this resulted in Anamelia pinning Zircon to the ground and straddling his groin, which resulted in training staff having to remove her when Zircon appeared to be in pain. However, Zircon soon appeared to forgive Anamelia, and he showed her how to use a spear, a skill with which she was less familiar. Meanwhile, Demetrius and Pearl practiced using throwing knives together, and their skills with these weapons appeared to improve when they gave each other advice on how to use these weapons most effectively. Pearl then took Demetrius to the electronic station, and Linker from 3 fled when he saw them approaching. Pearl showed Demetrius how to manipulate a basic circuit, and in return, he helped her to camouflage herself in the survival station by using a mixture of bodily paints. Lynette and Marcellus separated to work on their clearly very different individual strengths. Marcellus headed to the weightlifting area, while Lynette searched around for something she might be able to try. Eventually, she settled on the camouflage station, figuring that no matter what arena they might be in, she'd have to learn to blend in like Otala advised. The real challenge for her was going to be blending in after the earlier events, in which District 5 had done anything but. She worked with the camouflage trainer for a few hours, all the while associating with no one but watching everyone. Lynette identified, as usual, the careers throwing around weapons and generally being intimidating, but saw no other allies or merit other than her district partner. Disappointed, she sat alone at lunchtime and watched the careers trying to recruit an irritated Marchalis at another table, though he rebuffed them. Eventually, Lynette decided to try out some smaller knives and throwing knives at the weapons station, although she was not very competent with any of them. So over the next few days, she instead honed her skills at the camouflage, snare and traps, and agility stations, again not talking to or interacting with any other tributes, and keeping her head down. When the assessments occurred, Zircon and Pearl each used a variety of weapons in order to score a 9, Demetrius, on the other hand, made the brave decision to not use any weapons except his own hands, which he used to pummel a training dummy against the wall, and despite being made of a strong fabric, it broke apart shortly after he began to attack. Due to this unusual skill, which appeared to intrigue the assessors, Demetrius scored a 10, and he seemed extremely pleased when he was shown to have outscored the tributes from District 1. For Anamelia's assessment, she only scored an 8. It is unknown what skill she chose to show, but Training Master Crane allegedly cut her assessment short, stating that he had definitely seen everything that they needed to see. Later, it was Marcellus' turn to demonstrate his abilities for the assessors, and while no one could know what he did at the time, it was highly likely that it was weightlifting, earning him a very respectable score of 8. At last it was Lynette's turn, and she surveyed the room as she entered. The assessors were all waiting expectantly, although some were distracted by food and drinks being brought out nearby. Lynette looked around calmly, although the room was only equipped with some weapon racks, weights, and a supply station for assorted materials. By now, she had built up quite a reputation of going for the shock factor in these games, and to her, it couldn't hurt to try again. She grabbed two training dummies from the back of the room, and several paints from the camouflage section of the supply cart, swiftly painting the dummies to look like a male tribute and a female tribute. In red paint, she wrote the number 1,127 on the male dummy, and 1,310 on the female dummy. Before turning to the assessors, and quietly stating that this was how many of each gender had died thus far in the Hunger Games, and how many people's blood was on their hands. Lina did not wait for a reaction, but rather quickly wiped off her hands on a rag and left the room, leaving the scene to unfold behind her. Lynette was thoroughly unsurprised when she received a training score of 4. In fact, she knew she could use it to her benefit, as being a 13-year-old tribute on the smaller side, most would not have expected her to score higher, and being underestimated was District 5's speciality. Whilst Demetrius and Damask from 8 had landed at the top of the pack with the highest scores of 10, Tinsel from 3 and Nutmeg from 7 
had both landed at the bottom, with scores of two. Tinsel also had the lowest odds at the time of the games, with initial victory odds of 99 to 1. The interviews took place the next day, with Eugenia Rubin still starting the proceedings in style by wearing an extremely extravagant gown that was designed and created by last year's victor, Ava Berwick. This dress was once again made from shiny metallic wires that held against Eugenia's body, whilst the wires upon her shoulders had been sculpted in a way to resemble the tornadoes that had occurred in the last year's games. Eugenia was applauded by the excited audience, and as she went to take her seat, the wires of the dress slowly untwisted and unravelled to reveal an expanding ball gown of grapevines. The audience cheered even louder this time, and before the interviews began, Eugenia made sure to credit Ava, who was sat in the audience, for this fine creation. Demetrius and Anna Amelia were dressed in sparkling gold garments that exuded opulence. Demetrius wore a suit, along with a wreath made of dark green leaves, which he placed within his dark hair. And Amelia was allegedly delighted with her dress, and instead of choosing the dark green leaves that Demetrius had used, she placed golden leaves through her blonde curls, which matched the colour of her dress. After Zircon and Pearl's interviews had gone extremely well, with even their victory odds improving shortly after, it was time for Anna Amelia's interview. Eugenia questioned her on her reaping games, and asked why she had a habit of breathing intensely whenever she had eliminated someone, to which Anna Amelia replied that she was simply excited to be representing her district, and that she looked forward to putting on a splendid show within the games. Eugenia then admitted that she was indeed curious to see how Anna Amelia was planning to do this. Demetrius was questioned by Eugenia on his calm manner, and how he did not seem as excited as former male tributes from District 2 to be representing his district for the games. Yet when Demetrius responded to Eugenia that he was excited, but did not necessarily need to show it in the same way as others, Eugenia jokingly gave the crowd a confused look, and said that she looked forward to seeing how excited Demetrius would become when the games began. Lynette and Marcellus were dressed to resemble their iconic moment at the parade. Marcellus was dressed in a golden suit, and his dreadlocks were woven with some of the streamers from the solar power costumes, while Lynette was given a dress that mimicked a real sunset, starting with a pale orange at the neckline, and fading down into soft blues and purples at the skirt. Her honey-coloured hair, normally untamed, was brushed out and put into ringlets. Lynette appeared on the stage first, and the audience went wild for the sun-inspired outfits made for these tributes by their stylists. Eugenia greeted Lynette and the two exchanged some pleasantries before Eugenia decided to ask about the fireworks and mooning incidents. Although Lynette would not divulge any more information about these events, she did turn to the audience and declare, expect the unexpected, causing an uproar in the crowd. When asked a moment later about how she believed her odds to be, a very young tribute in comparison to most of the others, Lynette shrugged and simply stated that age didn't matter as long as one had brains, beauty and booty. Just look at Bluebell Jansen, although she hastily added that she was joking a minute later. To Eugenia's displeasure, Marcellus was surly and in a bad mood during the interview, as usual, and only answered her questions with a few words at most. Despite his lack of stage presence, the audience still had faith in him as a strong but silent type, and he was politely applauded after leaving the stage. Overall, for the District 5 tributes, the interviews did not go at all badly this year. The next morning, the tributes were taken to the holding rooms beneath the arena. Before entering their tubes, they were dressed in plain white t-shirts and black trousers, along with perfectly shiny white trainers. When Aeneas visited Demetrius, he told him that instead of being wary of Zircon and Pearl, he should keep an eye on Anamelia instead, whilst Maxima told Anamelia that she should make sure to put on a decent show for the capital. Although it is unknown what Atalus said to Marcellus and Lynette, she is one of the few mentors to actually visit both of their tributes. It is unknown why so many of the mentors gave up on at least one of their tributes, but the lower scores of this year may have played a part in this common sentiment. The tributes were then placed in their tubes, and they rose into the arena. This year's games took place in an abandoned mannequin factory. Before the Second Rebellion, the building that was used for this year's games had once been a thriving powerhouse of production for fashionable garments that would be worn by capital citizens. Despite being located in the outskirts of the capital, the building had never been repaired and was left in its damaged state as a reminder of the damage that was encountered in the Second Rebellion. 
Throughout these games, the building was guarded by countless peacekeepers, and this led to there fortunately being no security incidents. The building itself was eight floors high, and was built around a large square courtyard, where fashion shows had been held when the building was still in use. Although the lower floors were still in general disarray, with the remnants of broken lights, windows and bricks strewn through the interweaving rooms, the upper floors had been better preserved, with a lot of the building's infrastructure remaining intact. There were even rooms that contained complete rows of well-organised mannequins, which still rested in the places that they had stood for the last 20 years. The tribute's podiums were equally placed around all four walls of the courtyard, which had also been untouched since the mid-70s, and this had allowed clumps of grass and large cracks to develop between the dirty tiles of the ground. Instead of a large cornucopia structure, a pile of weapons was simply placed in the centre of the courtyard, whilst a collection of sleeping bags, boxes of matches, and bottles of rat poison were placed around this central pile. Slightly further from these other supplies lay plenty of bread loaves, cheeses and fruits, along with a large supply of water bottles. When the tributes appeared to become fully aware of their surroundings, many of them seemed rather confused to be on the inside of a building. Instead of surveying the supplies, Anne Amelia from 2, who was stood between Lynette from 5 and Xander from 4, immediately began to look around at the other tributes, while sporting a rather mischievous grin as she did so. Demetrius from 2, who was stood on the other side of the courtyard between Quercus from 7 and Agora from 11, looked carefully at the supplies that were present, yet like several other tributes, he seemed rather confused by the lack of a cornucopia structure. Lynette tried to avoid Anne Amelia's gaze, and she instead looked for the nearest exit from the courtyard, but when she appeared to realise that the nearest door was in fact behind Anne Amelia's podium, she shuddered and looked at the next door to her left, which was several podium space away from her own podium. Meanwhile, Marcellus from five, who was stood a few podiums to Lynette's right between Linka from three and Nutmeg from seven, glared at the central pile of supplies with no real emotion. As the countdown started, many tributes panicked when they suddenly realised that the games were finally about to begin, with a sudden hysteria that Eugenia dubbed the countdown effect suddenly taking hold. Lynette even let out a quiet yelp, and she appeared to temporarily lose her balance, which made Xander cower when he appeared to worry that the mines next to Lynette's podium would go off. However, she just about managed to steady herself, and the gong subsequently sounded. Lynette immediately ran to the second nearest door, along with Tinsel from 3, Quercus from 7, and Scaramanga from 10, who also ran to the nearest doors and into the building. But as Lynette ran, she tripped upon a crack in the floor and fell next to another podium. As Lynette looked up and noticed the carnage occurring in the centre of the courtyard, she seemed aghast with terror. But when she noticed Demetrius running his sword through the boy from Six's stomach, she got back up and ran straight into the building. Apart from the four who had run, all the other tributes ran straight into the centre of the courtyard, although many tributes simply tried to grab some food or water from the outer supplies before running away. After grabbing a loaf of bread, Marcellus looked ready to grab a weapon from the central pile, but when he saw Anne Amelia standing on top of this pile with her bow and arrow at the ready, he quickly ran to his left, away from where she was facing, before looking for the nearest door. When the gong had sounded, all four careers had run straight into the centre of the courtyard for a weapon, with each of them being amongst the first tributes to arm themselves. Demetrius had quickly grabbed a sword, but when he saw the boy from six going for a sword just metres to his left, Demetrius quickly ran across and stabbed him before he could even notice Demetrius approaching. He then looked around and seemed to defend the central pile of weapons from any other tributes who seemed tempted. As for Anne Amelia, she had grabbed a bow and arrow before sprinting to the centre of the pile. She then started shooting her arrows as quickly as possible at any other tribute that she could. She once again seemed to be sensually breathing and shooting her arrows quicker and quicker as she shot the boy from 12 and then the girl from 4 in the head. She also hit Marcellus in the back as he was about to run through one of the doors, but he seemingly failed to notice that he had just received an arrow in his back. Within a minute, all the surviving tributes, except for the careers, had entered the building that surrounded the courtyard, although many of them seemed rather confused by the layout of this bottom floor, with a majority of tributes panicking when they could not find a stairwell that would lead into the upper floors, and many of them also seemed rather phased by the extremely lifelike mannequins that were scattered around these rooms. But when they heard the cheerful shouts of the careers nearing them through this building, many of these tributes opted to hide behind these mannequins, 
or in the corner of these rooms, behind whatever rubble they could find. Lynetta desperately looked for a stairwell, but when she heard other tributes running towards her location, she ran into a room that had many parts of broken mannequins scattered across the floor. She tripped on a brick as she entered, which caused her to fall next to one of the severed heads of the mannequin. This made Lynette scream, possibly due to the strange expression on this mannequin's face, and realising that she may have just given away her position after making this sound, Lynette quickly hid herself within a disorganised pile of these parts that lay by the wall. Marcellus had also become rather lost within the surrounding rooms, and just as he appeared to realise that he had walked into the same room three times now, he suddenly heard a scream coming from another room to his left, which viewers could see had belonged to Lynette when she saw the mannequin's head. Marcellus then ran towards this room, although it is heavily debated as to whether he knew if this was Lynette who had been screaming, but just as Marcellus was about to enter through the doorway to this room, Bovo from Ten ran up behind him and tackled him to the ground. Marcellus immediately tried to push Bovo from on top of him, although Bovo, who was also quite strong, was now holding Marcellus down by his arms. Bovo then placed his knees on Marcellus's hands, which continued to keep him from moving, just before Bovo grabbed a knife from his back pocket. He grinned as he readied the knife, and Marcellus still seemed to be in a bit of a daze from his head hitting the floor, yet whilst this fight was occurring, Lynette looked out from the pile of mannequin parts, and she appeared worried to see that Marcellus, her district partner, was in trouble. Lynette then emerged from the pile and grabbed a mannequin's leg, before slowly walking up behind Bovo, whose back was still turned to her as he got his knife ready to stab Marcellus. Although Lynette had made some noise when she moved the mannequin parts from on top of her, Bovo did not seem to notice, possibly due to the shouts and screams that were occurring in the other rooms, along with his attention being diverted to killing Marcellus. Just as Bovo held the knife in the air above Marcellus, Lynette smacked the mannequin's leg against the side of his head, with such force that he fell sideways to the ground and dropped his knife. Marcellus seemed relieved, but without wasting any time, he grabbed the knife that Bovo had just dropped before forcing it through his neck. Lynette screamed as the blood sprayed out of Bovo's neck, but Marcellus then grabbed her by the arm, along with the knife and the loaf of bread that he had dropped from being tackled. He ran towards the door, but Lynette quickly ran back to grab the mannequin's leg, before running away with Marcellus. Although they once again struggled to find the stairwell, they saw through the windows of the courtyard that the careers were on the other side of the building. They therefore realised that they could take some time to properly understand which direction they were heading, and after a few minutes, they found a stairwell which they used to reach the upper floors. Meanwhile, the careers had entered the building after gathering the remaining supplies from the cornucopia. The girl from Eight, who had just come back from reaching a dead end, ran around a corner in a frenzy and straight towards them, but before she could even stop herself, Zircon threw his spear which flew straight through her brain and out the other side of her head. He retrieved the spear, and the pack continued walking slowly through the rooms of the ground floor, carefully following the panic sounds of fleeing tributes. As they walked through the building, they were pleased to see a map of this floor. These maps were placed on the walls by each door to the courtyard, yet due to the panic that many tributes had experienced, none of them noticed these maps, which could have guided them to the nearest stairwells. They continued through the ground floor and combed through each of the rooms, looking for other tributes. After searching through a few rooms, Pearl heard someone running past the room that they were in, and so she ran towards the door, before throwing a knife down the corridor at the girl from Six, which made her fall to the ground. As Pearl finished her off, the rest of the career decided to head into the next room. Pearl caught up with them as they headed into this room, which was in fact the largest on this floor, and took up an entire side of the courtyard. They each examined a different part of the room, and Zircon stated that the mannequins must make the other tributes even more scared. Anne Amelia then pretended to dance with one of them, and she hummed a merry tune as she waltzed around the room. Yet just as Anne Amelia and the mannequin rhythmically floated into a darker corner of the room, she suddenly stopped moving and gasped in excitement when she saw Daisy from Nine cowering behind a large wooden box. Anne Amelia's face immediately lit up with an excited smile, and she let the mannequin fall to the floor. She then got her bow and arrow ready and called the other careers over. Yet just as Anne Amelia was telling them who she had found, Daisy begged her for mercy. Anne Amelia then looked back at Daisy and barked at her to not interrupt. The other careers quickly clambered over to where Daisy was hiding. Yet as Anne Amelia listed the possible ways to commit this kill, she was again interrupted by Daisy, who asked if she could join her and the other careers. Anne Amelia then shouted at Daisy to stop talking over her, or she would lose her temper. 
Demetrius said to Anamelia that she should just get on with it, but Anamelia responded with, where's the fun in that? But just as she was about to start another sentence, Daisy begged out for mercy once more, which made Anamelia turn towards her and glare. After being interrupted for a third time, Anamelia gasped at Daisy in disbelief before shooting her in the heart with an arrow. As Daisy stopped moving, Anamelia shouted, look what you've done, at her, before turning around and giving a dirty look to Demetrius. As a deathclaw entered from the outside of the building, through the window and towards Daisy's body, the group carried on through the ground floor, but did not find any more tributes. During this first hour of the games, the other tributes who had survived so far managed to find the stairwells, and they quickly travelled to the upper floors. Lynette and Marcellus eventually settled in a small room on the sixth floor, which Marcellus barricaded by sitting against the door. However, when Marcellus sat against the door, he finally noticed that an arrow was sticking out of the lower part of his back. Although he did not react that much to this injury, Lynette said that they needed to remove the arrow, even though Marcellus said that he would be okay, but Lynette insisted. Just as nine cannons started sounding, Lynette carefully removed the arrow from Marcellus's back, and she used his t-shirt to apply pressure to the wound. Marcellus thanked Lynette for helping him, and they proceeded to rest in this room and catch their breath. Meanwhile, on the second floor, the career tributes continued to comb through each room. They were unable to find any more tributes on this floor, but they became rather fascinated by the mannequins, with Anamelia stating that they could use them to create some rather outstanding deaths. Over the next few hours, Lynette and Marcellus remained in this higher room. Marcellus at first tried to create a strategic plan, but Lynette claimed that it was probably best to remain in this room for now. As the afternoon went by, Lynette looked out the window whilst Marcellus napped against the floor, which he claimed was best to do whilst they had the opportunity. However, in the late afternoon, Lynette awoke Marcellus when she thought that she could see movement in a room on the opposite side of the arena. As Marcellus got up, Lynette looked a little closer and could work out that Tinsel and Linka, both from three, were sat in a room on the sixth floor. Lynette tried to wave, but Marcellus quickly told her not to. But just as he was about to try and move her from next to the window, a screaming was heard from above, and a body went flying past them towards the ground. It was revealed that this was Maze from Nine, who flew past the window after being thrown through a higher window by Damask from Eight. Amazingly, Maze survived the fall, and he tried to crawl away, but the careers had heard his body hitting the ground, and they quickly entered the courtyard, with Zircon using his knife to kill Maze, which sounded a cannon shortly afterwards. After Maze's body was retrieved by a deathclaw, the career pack entered the ground floor once again, and relaxed in one of the closest rooms to the entrance. After a while, they realised that they had left a few supplies in the courtyard, and so Pearl and Zircon went to retrieve them. Whilst they were gone, Anamelia stated that she wanted to kill them soon, as Pearl seemed to be giving her some strange looks, but Demetrius said that they should wait until at least half of the remaining tributes had been eliminated. Anamelia said that Demetrius was no fun, but he responded that whilst Anamelia may be having fun, they needed to be strategic. Meanwhile, on the sixth floor, Marcellus finished napping, but Lynette had grown hungry. Marcellus allowed her to have some of his bread, and although Lynette thanked him profusely, he stated that she had saved his life earlier that day. So this was the least he could do in return, but he also mentioned that they had no water, and that there appeared to be none within the building. They agreed to leave the room later that night and look for some water, but as they had this conversation, another cannon was heard. This was shown to viewers to be Nutmeg from Seven, when she walked into a higher room that was full of mannequins that had been designed to look like tributes, who wore the same clothes as the competing tributes. Nutmeg had apparently failed to notice that Scaramanga from Ten had taken the place of one of these mannequins, and when Nutmeg walked past her, she quickly took a knife from her pocket and stabbed it through the back of Nutmeg's head, which immediately killed her. As darkness fell, the careers ate some of their food and remained in the large room on the ground floor, with all their supplies now collected. As they ate, Anamelia picked up a mannequin and pretended that it was speaking, by using Daisy's voice, to imitate her pleas for mercy. Zircon appeared to be the only career to find this amusing, and the others carried on eating. Marcellus and Lynette agreed to rest in their room, but looked for water and other supplies when the fallen were shown at midnight. Marcellus then sat against the door, whilst Lynette napped in a corner of the room. At midnight, the portraits of the girl from four, both tributes from six, Nutmeg from seven, the girl from eight, Maze and Daisy from nine, Bovo from ten, the boy from eleven, and both tributes from twelve were all shown in the sky, 
which left just 13 tributes remaining. During the analysis of the first day, Eugenia stated that Anamelia was definitely her favourite tribute so far from this year's lineup, but Training Master Crane stated that with a group like this, he had no real idea of who might win, especially as some of the non career tributes were in fact showing some rather strong initiative. Shortly after these portraits were shown, Lynette and Marcellus very carefully and quietly left the room in which they had been hiding. Although it was completely dark throughout the building, the light of the moon shone into the corridor outside this room, which allowed the pair to see to some degree. As a form of defence, Marcellus held the knife that he had taken from Bobo during the bloodbath, whilst Lynette still held the mannequin's leg at the ready. They very quietly walked through this corridor, and at first heard nothing but complete silence. Yet as they turned the corner along the next side of the building, Lynette gasped when she heard rustling and squeaking coming from along the ground. Lynette tried to pull on Marcellus' hand, so that they could go back to the room where they had originally been hiding, but Marcellus quietly whispered to her that they should not be scared, and that these animals, which he quickly identified as rats, were more likely to be scared of them. Marcellus waited quietly as Lynette gradually released her grip on his arm and agreed to continue. They walked very slowly through the corridor, but when a rat scurried straight over Lynette's foot, she let out a petrified squeal, and in order to avoid this happening again, Marcellus quickly picked Lynette up with just one of his hands and placed her onto his back. They then continued through the corridor and looked into various rooms, although there appeared to be nothing inside these rooms except for the moonlit silhouettes of mannequins. After completely browsing through the sixth floor, Lynette suggested that they head down to the fifth floor, which Marcellus agreed to. He took her down the stairs and they roamed through the corridors of this floor. Once again, the pair encountered nothing apart from more mischiefs of rats and the blank stares of countless mannequins. Although unbeknownst to them, they almost collided with Scaramanga, who was hiding in the corner of one of the rooms that they ventured into. However, after heading down to the fourth floor, they soon heard a quiet mechanical whirring, and after approaching this sound, they found a vending machine that so far appeared to be untouched. When they looked at the contents of the machine, Marcella signed to Lynette that the food and drink inside must be old, but Lynette replied that it looked to be new. This sign language had to be interpreted by Eugenia, who also stated that due to the loud noises and hence levels of deafness in District 5, the children were taught sign language when they began school, which would allow them to communicate throughout their district. Lynette then signed that she would happily risk consuming some of the contents, and so Marcellus agreed that she could do this, although being from the districts, they seemed to be unaware of how this machine worked. Game Maker Whimsywick had actually ordered for some coins to be placed beneath and on top of this machine, which the tributes could use to pay for its products, but Marcellus failed to notice these and simply smashed his hand through the glass instead. The machine's alarm immediately sounded, and Lynette panicked, but whilst Marcellus pulled his hand out and examined the glass that was now embedded within his fingers, Lynette grabbed as much food and drink as she could from the machine whilst the alarm blared on. Once Lynette had taken as much as she appeared capable of carrying, Marcellus grabbed her by the arm and once again placed her on his back as they ran away. The machine's alarm was heard throughout the building, with the careers quickly coming to the conclusion that it was a trap and hence should not be approached, whilst the other tributes all stayed where they were and did not dare approach the area where this sound was coming from. As Lynette and Marcellus fled from the machine and hid in a small room on the other side of the fourth floor, many rats quickly flocked towards the sound of the machine, before climbing inside and either consuming or contaminating all the remaining food and drink. Marcellus and Lynette then rested in this room, and they were surprised to see that there was a small window towards the top of one of the walls, which led into the next room. When the alarm finally stopped ringing after ten minutes, they gleefully consumed some chocolate and cola. Crane also revealed that this was the only vending machine that had been provided in the arena, and so by allowing the rats to destroy the remaining food and drink supplies, the pair from District 5 had unintentionally made things much more difficult for their opponents, and they had therefore improved their own victory odds rather dramatically. After a while, Lynette agreed to take the first night watch whilst Marcella slept, and they swapped halfway through the night, whilst the careers each took turns to keep watch in pairs, although they did not see any movement during the night. After sunrise the next morning, Lynette and Marcellus continued to rest in the same room that they had been before, and Lynette suggested that it could be a good idea for them to barricade themselves into this room with their food and drink supplies and wait it out, whilst the other tributes killed each other. Marcellus appeared to have no problems with this plan, and he continued to rest against the door. Meanwhile on the ground floor, the careers awoke early and carefully made their way through the lower floors. Unbeknownst to them, 
The nearest tributes to the ground floor were Lynette and Marcellus, who were on the fourth floor. The career pack spent the morning combing through each of the rooms on the ground floor, then the second and third floors, but without finding any tributes. Anne Amelia tried to convince the group that they should quickly make their way up to the higher floors, where the other tributes were more likely to be hiding, but Demetrius had to tell her on multiple occasions that they needed to check these rooms first, so that they did not miss anyone. Yet when this group finally made it to the fourth floor around midday, they and practically all the other tributes were surprised and scared to see shutters suddenly coming down over the windows of both sides of the building, which left the corridors and rooms in almost complete darkness. Lynette began to panic, but Marcellus prompted her to sit by the door with him, and he put his arm around Lynette in order to calm her. However, just as she appeared to finally calm down, the pair heard the careers shouting to each other as they came along the nearby corridor. During this time, the careers suddenly became rather gleeful, probably because they realised that due to the blackout, it would now be easier to kill other tributes. They bashed against each of the doors along this side of the floor, and once they were inside a room, they lit a match in order to see more clearly, before moving on to the next room. As the careers came nearer to their location, Lynette started to panic once more, and through the darkness she could just about make out Marcellus signing to her that she should grab the supplies and head to the small window on the wall of this room as quickly as she could. Lynette appeared confused, but as Pearl bashed against the door that Marcellus was still sat against, he signed Lynette to hurry, and she quickly got on top of a box and opened the window, just as Pearl merrily shouted to the other careers that there was someone in this room. Lynette signed to Marcellus, asking how he was going to escape this room, and he grinned and held his knife up, before once again signing at her to go through the window. Pearl then thrust her knife through the door, and it very narrowly avoided Marcellus's head, and so he stood up whilst Lynette climbed through the window. She then pointed at the box that she had used to climb up to the window, then signed at Marcellus to place it in front of the door. Lynette watched as the careers tried to hammer through the door, which Marcellus held his foot against, whilst trying to grab the box, but just as he finally managed to grab it, the door swung open and all four careers flooded into the room. Anne Amelia immediately ran forwards and jumped at Marcellus, but he punched her in the face as she flew towards him. Demetrius then appeared to realise what could happen if he allowed Anne Amelia to try and deal with Marcellus, and he quickly threw a knife at Marcellus, which hit him in the brain. As Lynette quickly ran through the next room, she burst into tears when she heard Marcella shouting out in pain, but she continued into the corridor. Although Zircon was now keeping watch in the corridor, he was unable to see Lynette running through the darkness, and she continued up the nearest stairs, just as Marcellus's cannon sounded, and his body was removed by a death claw through the window of the room. Although Lynette at first ran up the stairwell, she appeared to realise that the careers had been on the lower floors earlier, and therefore it might be easiest for her to avoid them by going back downstairs, in the opposite direction to where they were likely to head next. This move turned out to be a wise one, with the careers soon moving up to the next floor, but unfortunately for them, many tributes were able to hear them coming up through the building, and they therefore continued up to the top floor, ahead of the careers. After two more hours of heading through the fifth, then sixth, then seventh floors, the careers were on the top floor of the building. After knocking on a few rooms, it was not only Anne Amelia who was now impatient at not having found any tributes, with Zircon and Pearl now also apparently hungry for blood. Viewers had seen that shortly before arriving on this floor, Agora from Eleven had fled from the sound of the careers and ran straight into the tribute mannequin room, where Scaramanga from Ten had been hiding. Although Agora had not spotted Scaramanga through the darkness, Scaramanga quickly hushed Agora, and despite not being able to see who this was that had been talking to her, Agora was quickly silent, and just like Scaramanga, tried to blend herself in amongst the mannequins. A few minutes later, the careers entered the room. Viewers could see through the night vision cameras that both Scaramanga and Agora's eyes widened after hearing the approaching careers, especially when Anamelia jokingly called out that some rats are going to die today. Yet both girls still managed to remain completely still. The careers each walked along different rows of the mannequins, and Demetrius pointed out that the mannequins looked exactly like tributes. Anne Amelia in particular seemed extremely captivated by the outline of these mannequins through the darkness, even looking Scaramanga in the eye, but failing to realise that she was not a mannequin. Demetrius continued along another row, where he walked straight past Agora. However, just as he was about to turn around, he looked back to Agora and eyed her very closely through the darkness, before saying to the other tributes that this mannequin looked exactly like one of the female tributes. The others laughed, 
but Pearl then came over for a closer look, and at that moment, Agora suddenly panicked and kicked Demetrius in the groin. A flurry of shouts and screams were heard as Demetrius and Pearl finally realised that Agora was not in fact a mannequin. Agora ran into Pearl and punched her in the face, but Demetrius quickly tackled Agora and bashed her head against the floor before Pearl ran her knife through Agora's head. Just as her cannon sounded, Scaramanga quickly reanimated and readied her knife as she crept up behind Zircon, who was trying to see what was happening through the darkness. Scaramanga then stabbed Zircon through the back of the head, and as he shouted out and fell to the floor, Scaramanga stabbed him once again in the back of the head before running away. Zircon's cannon sounded as well, and the other career shouted out in confusion as they tried to understand what had just happened, but before they could even regroup, Scaramanga had already crept out of the room and was now running down the nearest corridor. As suddenly as the windows had closed, they reopened, and the Deathclaw came in to collect the bodies of Agora and Zircon. The careers were somewhat blinded by the sunlight that came through the windows, and they quickly decided to leave this room and head back down to the courtyard, which they hoped would give them a better view of the surrounding floors over the next few hours. Yet almost immediately after the career pack re-entered the courtyard, the sun began to set, and they were once again plunged into darkness. They continued to rest and look up at the surrounding corridors, before discussing what they would aim to do over the next day. After deciding to head up to the highest floors after the next day's sunrise, another cannon suddenly sounded. It was shown to viewers that Linker and Tinsel, both from 3, had rewired some of the electrical wires on the seventh floor during the blackout, so that if someone were to try and turn on one of the light switches, they would receive an electric shock. But the pair then grabbed some glass from a broken window and waited on the seventh floor for someone to try and turn on one of the lights. The plan worked, and Quercus from 7 received a near-fatal electric shock, which left him yelling out in pain. As he tried to get back up, the pair from District 3 quickly found him, and Tinsel stabbed him in the neck, killing him instantly. Lynette spent the evening resting in a room on the second floor, and she still seemed upset by the death of Marcellus. She ate a little, but fell asleep shortly before midnight. The portraits of the fallen were then shown to be Zircon from 1, Marcellus from 5, Quercus from 7, and Agora from 11 which left a relatively low level of nine tributes remaining. The next day, Pearl, who had taken the second night watch in the courtyard, woke Demetrius and Anamelia as the sun rose. They ate and drank a little as the sun's rays gradually entered above the high walls of the surrounding building. As they had already planned, the trio made their way quickly, yet carefully, to the sixth floor of the building. Although Anamelia begged the other two careers to not search the rooms on the first to fifth floors of the building, and for them to head straight to the sixth floor, Pearl insisted that they do a quick check of each room on the five lower floors. When they reached the second floor, Lynette was fortunate enough to hear the pack coming, due to Anamelia's rather loud rendition of a song about a puppet on a string. Although Lynette was clearly panicking at the sound of the approaching careers, she rapidly hid herself inside a wooden crate that had originally been used to store pre-made fabrics. The crowds in Snow Square jeered as Lynette tried to curl herself inside, but due to her smaller frame, the jeers gradually morphed into cheers when she had completely folded her body to fit inside this crate. Just as Lynette managed to fit her right foot inside, Pearl suddenly entered the room. The camera on the wall could show Pearl standing in the doorway and looking carefully across the room, whilst Lynette was holding her breath in terror within the crate. Yet after a quick visual examination, Pearl nodded and made her way back into the corridor. As the careers made their way up to the third floor, Lynette gradually uncurled herself from the box. Although this appeared to be rather difficult for her at first, which caused laughter throughout the snow square, Lynette eventually managed to roll out of the box, and she rested on the floor in a mixture of exhaustion and relief. The careers continued up to the sixth floor, and began to look through the nearest rooms. Whilst Pearl and Anamelia headed to their left after reaching this floor, Demetrius headed to his right, and told the girls that he would meet them back by the stairwell in a few minutes. He continued along the corridor, and carefully scoured each room, but just as he was halfway through the doorway of a room at the corner of the building, the door suddenly slammed upon his face and he shouted out in pain. It was seen by viewers that Linker and Tinsel, both from 3, had spent most of the games hiding in this room, but when they heard Demetrius coming, Linker had got ready to attack. As Demetrius held his hand to his nose, which was now bleeding, Linker quickly pushed him to the floor before grabbing Tinsel's hand and running past Demetrius to the nearest stairwell. 
Anamelia and Pearl heard this commotion and ran around the corner. Pearl shot an arrow, which very nearly hit Tincel, but the pair from District 3 then ran around the corner and headed down the opposing stairwell. However, just as Anamelia and Pearl asked Demetrius what had happened, one of the mannequins, which had been lying on the floor of this room, suddenly turned its head towards them. Pearl jumped when she noticed this mannequin's movement, and she quickly alerted the others. Initially, they all looked rather perplexed, but when the mannequin suddenly sat up and looked in their direction, Pearl and Demetrius gasped in shock and said that they needed to run, but Anamelia's eyes glowed in excitement. It then started to stand and slowly walk through the room towards the trio. Demetrius tried to pull on Anamelia's sleeve, and Pearl opened the door so that they were ready to head back into the corridor, but Anamelia remained entranced by the moving mannequin as it continued walking towards her. She then slowly said, Awesome, in an almost childlike tone. However, in an instant, the mannequin suddenly charged towards Anamelia. Within a split second, Anamelia's facial expression of admiration turned to fear, but it was too late for her to run. As she screamed, the mannequin used its hands to pick her up by her neck and strangle her. She tried to kick it in the groin, and Pearl shot an arrow at its head, but this did not weaken it in any way. Demetrius then gave Pearl a resigned look that seemed to indicate that they needed to leave, even though Anamelia was still screaming. Pearl shouted that she was sorry before running down the nearest corridor with Demetrius. Anamelia, who was now struggling for breath against the wall, screamed at Demetrius and Pearl for them to help her, before quickly changing to insulting them. Anamelia's final sentence was, You useless, sodding fuck! But just as she said this final syllable, the mannequin smashed her head against the brick wall behind her, with such force that her speech suddenly finished and her cannon sounded. Meanwhile, Linka and Tinsel were making their way down through the stairwell and were almost back in the courtyard, whilst Lynette was sat at the side of her room, braiding her hair. She was the last of the tributes to have a mannequin activated in her room, with game maker Whimsywick later explaining that one of these new types of mannequins had been placed in every single room of the building, ready for when this event would take place. The crowds in Snow Square started to shout at Lynette, who was now humming to herself as a camera on the wall in front of her showed a mannequin on the other side of the room, slowly activating and standing up behind her. Although due to the volume of her humming, Lynette was seemingly oblivious to this impending danger. The mannequin's head rotated and it walked towards Lynette, who still apparently had no idea what was happening behind her, but when it was halfway across the room towards her, it tapped its foot against a brick, and Lynette suddenly twisted around when she heard the brick moving. She screamed as she saw the mannequin making its way directly towards her, and she frantically searched for a brick. Eventually, she found one and threw it at the mannequin. However, the brick flew straight past the mannequin and smashed through the window. Lynette panicked and managed to grab her bottle of water, but as the mannequin's speed suddenly increased, she got up and ran out of the door, with her bloodstained t-shirt very narrowly avoiding the grasp of the mannequin. As Lynette ran along this corridor at the second floor, she was alarmed at the sound of a cannon, but made her way up to the third floor and hid in an empty room there. By this point, the activated mannequins had been deactivated, and they fell back to the ground. Yet as Lynette finally appeared to catch her breath and rest in this room, another cannon sounded. It was shown to viewers that when Lynette had thrown a brick at the approaching mannequin, it had smashed through the window and hit Linker, who had just run into the courtyard below with Tinsel. Although he was not killed immediately, he was quickly knocked unconscious and bled out within a few minutes. As for the second cannon, Xander from 4 had also been attacked by a mannequin on the seventh floor. He had managed to free himself from the grip of its arms, but he subsequently ran down a corridor and straight into the room where Damask from 8 happened to be waiting. Damask then grabbed Xander, and before the latter could even put up a fight, Damask had thrown him through the nearest window and he hit the ground in the courtyard, which led to him also dying shortly afterwards. Although Tinsel had been crying at the sight of Linka's body, she screamed in horror when Xander's body landed just metres from her, and she proceeded to run back into the building. Seconds later, Pearl and Demetrius re-entered the courtyard, where they stayed for the rest of the day until the sun set. There were now only six tributes remaining, including them, but the pair seemed relatively trustworthy of allowing the other to keep watch over both of them. When midnight came, the portraits of Anamelia from two, Linka from three, and Xander from four were shown in the sky. On the morning of the fourth day, Lynette awoke within some broken mannequins, curled up in a ball. After the events of the previous day, it was clear that she was tired and wished to sleep, but she still got up and ate some cheese and grapes that she had found in the room. For the most of the morning, Lynette kept vigilant watch, 
with only one nail-biting close call as Damask walked right past her room. Bored by the general lacklustre attitude in the arena this morning, and the wide scattering of the remaining tributes, gamemaker Winsywick decided to spice things up, as the game makers tend to do. All was calm and peaceful until Damas began coughing uncontrollably in the corridor outside Lynette's room. Lynette tentatively crept out, opening the door to investigate, and immediately withdrew back into her room. A suspicious hazy cloud was drifting in the air outside near Damask, and she quickly grabbed a nearby old rag and jammed it under the door crack to stop the gas from leaking in. Damask, meanwhile, was doubled down in the hall in the midst of a hacking frenzy. During this panic and confusion, Lynette heard heavy footsteps in the corridors around her room, and shouts of alarm as other tributes tried to cover their noses and mouths with their shirts, fleeing down towards the courtyard. A cry of alarm sounded as Tinsel tripped on Damask outside this room, knocking them both down for a moment, although only Tinsel was able to hop back up and keep running, due to Damask's weakened state. He groaned in agony as Tinsel inadvertently whacked him in the shoulder while fleeing. Meanwhile, Lynette scrambled around her hiding space, searching for anything to help evade this gas. By sheer luck, she happened upon a drawer full of textile samples, remnants of the factory's glory days, and tied a few together to create a makeshift face mask, as time was running out before she had to leave her room or risk suffocation. Yanking the rag out from under the door, and wheezing slightly from the gas that had managed to seep through, Lynette stumbled into the hallway, appearing slightly ill from exposure to the gas. Just like Tinsel, she failed to notice the curled-up damask and tripped on him too, eliciting an audible groan of either pain or frustration from him as he lay on the floor hacking. Lynette accidentally dropped the rag on his head as well while popping back up to keep running. Damask had given up on groaning in pain at this point. Panting heavily, all the remaining tributes except for Damask continued hurrying down to the cornucopia area. The cameras revealed Lynette, Scaramanga, and Tinsel stumbling down the stairs, while on the opposite side, Pearl and Demetrius held hands to avoid losing track of each other in the fog. Suddenly, there was a shout of alarm. In the haze, Demetrius and Pearl had smacked right into Scaramanga, who was the closest to the courtyard. Demetrius and Pearl had just been sent masks by sponsors, and although they were unclear at first as to why they had been given these masks, the toxic cloud that soon entered the arena quickly answered this question. Cleverly, Scaramanga had stolen a bandana from one of the workshop rooms to fashion a face covering. However, Pearl quickly recovered from the shock and threw a spectacular punch right into Scaramanga's nose, knocking her backward as blood spurted everywhere. Charging forward, Demetrius swiped Scaramanga's supplies while Pearl ripped off her bloody bandana and victoriously forced her jaws apart, causing her to inhale copious amounts of toxic gas. For a second, everyone in the arena was bewildered as two cannons rang out almost simultaneously, creating a strange dissonance. Damask had finally succumbed to his respiratory struggles after heaving for about five minutes straight, yet Tinsel and Lynette kept running. The gas began to disperse, and when Pearl and Demetrius entered the courtyard first, they took a break to inspect the hall of supplies they had gotten from Scaramanga. Meanwhile on the stairs, Tinsel was unaware that her current path was where Scaramanga had died, as indicated by the cannons earlier, not arriving until after her body had been removed by a death claw. The only ominous reminder left was the bloody bandana on the floor. In her haste to flee the retreating gas, Tinsel flew right past the bandana and down the final staircase, into the central courtyard. For a brief moment, there was a startled glance exchanged between Pearl, Demetrius and Tinsel, but this hesitation only lasted a fraction of a second, as Pearl tore off her face covering, grabbed a knife, and leapt right at Tinsel. Pearl physically knocked the smaller girl to the ground as she savagely stabbed the knife into and out of her heart without mercy. Tinsel's cannon rang out only moments later, leaving a deafening silence in its wake, punctuated only by Pearl's heavy panting. Turning to face her district partner, Pearl sighed and flipped her hair, about to take a drink of water from her bottle, when she saw the dagger in Demetrius's hand and the calm, practical look in his eye. In a flash, he struck, arm raised for the kill, but she was too fast and parried with her water bottle, spraying droplets everywhere as the dagger halved it in a single clean splice. Yet Pearl used the momentum from Demetrius' failed strike to shove him aside and pick up her discarded knife. The two circled each other, with neither noticing that Lynette was behind them, having just followed Scaramanga and Tinsel's path down the stairs, but she quickly dived back into the building. Panicked about her chances of surviving should either one of the other two tributes survive their fight, Lynette began searching around for a useful weapon. 
This was one of the poorly preserved rooms, with dust, mannequin parts, and rusty machinery all scattered around with no rhyme or reason. Lynette quickly combed through the machinery, hoping to find a lever or electrical part which she could use her district knowledge to operate, but with no success. Capital viewers could see at this point that time was running out for Lynette. Demetrius and Pearl were gearing up to strike, and it was apparent to viewers that only one would live through that encounter. In the end, Lynette braced herself and chose the only weapon she believed she could use. Moments later, as Demetrius let out a sigh of relief at having successfully killed Pearl, he sharply looked around the courtyard. Demetrius swigged some water and commenced his search, turning over rubble and searching in rooms. All the while, the audience members could see Lynette, crouched near the courtyard and ready to attack. When at last Demetrius came close, Lynette pounced from a room that was adjacent to the courtyard and ferociously bashed at the back of his head with a large disembodied plastic mannequin leg. Demetrius was in such shock from being attacked with an oversized limb that he'd reeled backwards and almost slipped in the pool of pearl and tinsel's blood that still remained on the floor. Despite this, he recovered seconds later and stabbed at Lynette, who ducked due to her smaller size and evaded it. She swung wildly and with very poor aim, as the leg was about the same size as her, and Demetrius took advantage of it to overpower her, sweeping his leg to distract her but using his elbow to knock her flat on her back, and with the plastic leg waving helplessly in the air. At this time, Demetrius told Lynette, You put on a good fight and a good show, kid, but it's time to go, as he slashed down at her. Even Lynette was seen squeezing her eyes tightly shut as the dagger found its target, except it didn't. Every viewer in Panem, including Demetrius and Lynette, squinted at their screens in total shock as they all realised the dagger was not lodged in Lynette's heart, but rather the mannequin leg, which she had unknowingly raised in one last bid to protect herself. There was a second of complete and utter chaos as these final two tributes realised that the games were not yet over. Demetrius reached for his dagger at the exact moment Lynette tried to haul the leg away from him, resulting in an awkward occurrence of tug of war. Demetrius yanked at the foot, while Lynette held onto the thigh with all her might, until the strain was so great that, to both tributes' alarm, the legs slipped out of their grasp and went flying halfway across the courtyard, inciting uproarious laughter in the capital at the absurdity of the situation and dislodging the dagger from the leg. Demetrius nosedived at the leg and dagger, and was only an inch away from being able to retrieve his dagger, when Lynette desperately lunged forward and kicked it away towards the pile of supplies, where it got lost within these supplies, and left only the leg for the pair to fight over. Demetrius was scandalised by the loss of his dagger, and furiously made a final attempt to kill Lynette with just his bare hands. As he charged towards her, Lynette panicked and seized the leg, dragging it laboriously behind her, and with great effort swung it at his stomach. Demetrius gasped as the wind was knocked out of him, but recovered. The intensity of this fight was intriguing many viewers, with bets being placed on if Lynette and her plastic leg could overpower the sheer strength and training of Demetrius, or if this year would mark another swift victory for the careers. The two continued battling it out, Lynette parrying Demetrius's blows with the leg, and Demetrius smoothly avoiding further whacks. But the fatigue was beginning to show in both tributes, and the end was in sight for one of them. Demetrius cleverly calculated when Lynette was going to strike again, and used it to pull on the leg in an attempt to wrestle it away from her, but Lynette resisted, and pulled back with all of her strength remaining. However, Lynette appeared to realise something. Backing up onto the stairs and using the stairs for leverage, she pulled one final tug with everything she had left, and the next moment, let go. Demetrius, taken aback by Lynette's sudden dropping of the leg, was even more taken aback half a second later, when the release of Lynette's stronger force on the leg launched it back at him, and he was kicked in the face by the foot. While this did not do much damage, it allowed Lynette to run down, seize the leg, and bash Demetrius across the skull many times, sounding his cannon within a minute. She collapsed onto her knees in pure exhaustion, still limply holding the leg, as it was formally announced by Eugenia that the victor of the 82nd Hunger Games was Lynette Laurier of District 5. It was also reported that Lynette was in a daze as she was picked up to leave the arena, and kept mumbling something about never looking at mannequins the same way again. For her victor's interview, Lynette wore a light blue dress to match her eyes. Overall, she was composed and very frank, going back and forth with Eugenia about various topics. In her interview, 
Eugenia asked Lynette about a potential victor's nickname for her, after all the excitement she had stirred up before and during this year's games. They debated over a few, such as Lightning Legs Lynette or Loopy Lynette, but eventually settled on the much more catchy Miss Mayhem. Eugenia also asked why Lynette chose to mix in both elements of District 5's typical sneakiness with some of her more memorable moments when competing, to which Lynette responded that she didn't know the answer herself and would rather like some dinner. The Capitol crowd was overall startled but amused by Lynette's strange antics on and off the stage, and she returned home to live as a mentor to future District 5 tributes. Lynette never married, and when asked about marrying or having children, she responded simply with, Ew but eventually adopted a daughter, Starling. They would go on to live happily with her mother, sisters, and Sir Pumpkinwiggle's descendants in the Victor's Village of District 5.